Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Pace Setters. Of course, last week was the first episode with Will Rickson. Thanks for all the feedback on that. It's been fantastic. If you thought Will was great, though, we've got a special treat for you this week. Our guest in the chair, in the hot seat, Ellen Bartley, uh, all the way, the queen of the Riverina. Ellen, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, you're already bringing more laughs than Will in week one. I like it. I like it. Uh, how's things going for you? You've, you know, you obviously you've had a great season, both uh, as a trainer and a driver. You're happy with how things have gone? Yeah, definitely. Um, we have had a good season, and Blake and I have actually just purchased our own um, property, and we've been settled in here with the horses for about six weeks, and. It's always a bit nervous, like moving properties and um, getting used to the different track and whatnot that we're using, but the horses are still going really well. So, yeah, we're happy. Okay. What's the grand plan there? What's the vision? Uh, the vision, oh, well, just there's a few little things we want to do to get it set up, like exactly how we want it. But, um, yeah, the, the vision at the moment is to just, yeah, keep, keep trucking along and, and trying to get some more winners and, and yeah, see how we go. Okay. You mentioned Blake. Obviously, Blake, we, we refer to as Blake Jones. People in the industry will be aware of, of Blake's work. But, you know, hopefully we're, we're getting a few viewers here that, that aren't necessarily tuning into the harness racing week on week. We're trying to convert them, aren't we, Ellen? But um, that, that partnership's, a, um, you know, obviously crucial to the success that you guys have. You really bounce off each other, don't you? Yeah, definitely. Like, um, Blake pretty much drives them all at the races and and um, which is good because that means I don't have to get out there. But um, you know he's obviously one of the best in the arena, so it's it's always good. Um, you know you can send him out on the horse, and and he's going to give it every chance. And yeah, like I really like to focus on the feeding and and the muscle work, and like make sure that they're all healthy and whatnot. And and yeah, it's good that we sort of both have our different things that we focus on. Who's the boss then? When Blake goes out and drives a horse, who's the boss? <laughs> He'll tell you he's the boss, but I'm definitely the boss. I think I'm a bit more scarier than Blake. So uh, oh, he, he thinks he's the boss and I think I'm the boss, but, yeah. Who's uh, who's giving who the instructions? And obviously, you know, you're, you're the trainer. Your, your name's listed on the horse. Are, are you giving him uh, race instructions? Uh, I pretty much just say to him to go out and um, get home, get back safely. Uh, he, he, I like to think I give him instructions, but he doesn't listen to me anyway. So yeah, I just tell him to go out and do his best because yeah, he doesn't listen to me anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, when you say that he doesn't listen to you, like, are we talking just as far as racing goes, or, uh, or is this a, a general trend in the relationship, Jimmy? <laughs> I think it's a general trend in the relationship. It's um, definitely maybe a bit of selective hearing on on Blake's half, probably on my half as well. But yeah, no, we um, we get along quite well, and yeah, it's really good. How did you go about meeting each other? How how did this relationship come to be? Um, well, actually, I went to uni in Wagga for two years, and I used to live um, just across from the old Wagga sh- um, track, the showgrounds, and. Uh, Blake was over one night, I know it happened to be uni night, and we just, yeah, met each other at the pub and, and yeah, um, sort of recognised each other and, yeah, it just went from there. Yeah. Well, that's how all good relationships start, isn't it? You know, <laughs> at a uni pub. night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uni night, not on the drink. Now, now obviously, well, I want to talk to you a little bit about the business, but you, you mentioned uni. What were you doing at uni? Um, I did two years of equine science, uh, but it wasn't really for me and, yeah, I, I called it quits after two years and, yeah, I didn't really – I just didn't enjoy it that much, to be honest, so, yeah. Okay. But but these, but you are actually applying, I assume, some of the skills and some of the key learning tools that you would have picked up in those two years at the moment. Like, you're doing – you're putting a lot of work into into a business uh, with regards to equine welfare and, and massage therapy for horses. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more through that? Uh, definitely, I definitely learned um, a lot at uni and it, and it sort of opened up my eyes um, to things that we could go on and progress to. And, and when I left uni, I um, actually went and studied a certificate in equine sports therapy. So it, uh, pretty much massage therapy and sports therapy for horses, um, focusing mainly on muscles and recovery and rehab and that sort of stuff. Okay. Are we doing enough work in that space? I mean... You know, I can't imagine there's a lot of people doing it um, and so it would be relatively niche. But how important 
do you think it is in the in the performance of a horse from a racing perspective? Uh, it's uh, very important. I mean, like you wouldn't see a footballer go out and play a game of footy without having a, a massage or, or some sort of um, work done on themselves. And, and they are athletes and you have to treat them like athletes. And it's, yeah, incredibly important to just keep on top of it because uh, it could be the difference between, you know, a win and, and running second, like just little things like that. Um, just, yeah, it's very important. I'd imagine it comes with challenges. I mean, you know, working with a horse just by nature, but, but trying to massage muscles and, and do some level of correction. What are the major challenges that you face with, with trying to trying to work on a horse? Um, well, the first one would be I'm quite short. So um, when you get the big giants, it's a bit hard on the body when you've constantly got your arms up in the air um, working on them. But uh yeah it is physically very physically demanding and if I have a big day I come home and I'm pretty exhausted but then at the end of the day too like um if it if you're helping the horses then the being tired and overworked and whatnot is worth it really yeah has it continued to evolve and and is the the science when it comes to to um uh the physical side of a horse is it continuing to evolve yeah definitely and I, I think um you know, it, every day it progresses more and more and, and there's a million different like little knickknacks that you can buy now um, to help the horses, whether it be like a massage gun or an equissage and whatnot. And um, all that stuff's really important, but yeah, it's also important to just get like a hands-on feel and and I think, yeah, getting a hands-on feel for the horse first and then you can recommend um, other little um, massage devices and whatnot. But yeah, the, the science um, is unreal. Like you could get lost in it very easily just reading all, all the all the different techniques and, and technologies and stuff that they're bringing out nowadays. It's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. So what's the most common sort of, uh, I guess, part of a horse or, or zone on a horse that, that really needs some level of correction or manipulation, massage? What do you typically see? Um, uh, in particular in paces, because, um, because of their gait, uh, it's a bit different to a trotter and it's quite unnatural to their body still. Um, a lot of paces will go sore, sort of in their hind quarter and around the sacroiliac joint and that sort of stuff. And um, nearly nine times out of ten, they'll all have some sort of pain in, in the hind quarter or up around their pelvis and hips and that sort of stuff. And um, if you get on top of it early, it's actually something that you can um, treat and fix quite quickly. Yeah. Okay. So, to the uneducated, me, that is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love going for a massage. How different are we? I mean, is it that far removed massage therapy on a horse to massage therapy on a human? Can you can you draw any parallels there, or is uh, it completely different game? No, I think it's it. It's definitely um, very similar. Um, like sometimes you can just give a horse a massage just for the sake because they like it, um, which is like, you know, if you go on a holiday for, to Bali or somewhere, you get a massage just because you like it. Um, but then you can also do your remedial and therapeutic side of stuff and deep tissue and that and whatnot. It, it just depends on the horse and, and yeah, what, what they feel like and all that sort of stuff. Okay. So, and, and you're doing work on not just your own um, stable horses too, aren't you? You sort of, you know, gun for hire around the, around yeah. the area. Um, how do other trainers feel when you when you turn up to go and work on some of their horses and then you're going to be racing against them? I know. I, I feel that we have a few cheeky conversations every now and then and a few milkshake bets and um, whatnot. But I get as much, if I go and work on someone's horse and it comes out and, and wins, I get like a, the biggest thrill out of it and, and kick out of it because I know I'm, I might have only played a small part, but it's um, nice to think that I helped, I helped in some way. So, yeah. Yeah. Is there one where you've seen that real quick turnaround just based on a little bit of therapy? Um, probably um, Peter Burks had a mare called Sarah Ann and he, um, she had a few little problems that we worked on and I don't want to claim all the credit because Pete is a fantastic horseman in his own right, but um, he sort of said once we started working on her, she really she really come through with the goods and, and started putting it together and, and won a few races for him and whatnot. There you go. Oh, yeah. Two years at uni was enough, Ellen. Hey, you didn't, need, <laughs> yeah. you didn't need to be going any longer than that. No, definitely You'll not. You'll be the one doing the lectures. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds like you're doing great things, you know, and um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I find it really intriguing, you know, the, the work that gets done for, for horses and how that's progressing and, and how that continues to move and, and, to, and the science that goes into our sport. I think it's, been, um, it's fascinating, really. Um, I'm sure you get that. I'm sure you probably get that a lot from people when you, when, you know, when you have that conversation with them about what you do. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, a, a lot of people that aren't necessarily involved with horses and that uh, they ask what you do for a living, and and I say, oh, you know, I'm a, I have race horses, but then I'm a massage therapist, and they just can't believe it. They're like, do people really get their horses massaged? And and yeah, it's it's unreal. Yeah. Yeah. How does it feel for you? I mean, you you've been so successful down there in the Riverina region in particular, but statewide. I mean, your name's always, you know, um. You know, in the upper echelons of the of the leadership boards around premierships and that um, for the past few years at least, how does it feel for you to to be one of the female leaders in our sport? Um, I, I do feel like privileged that um, we do get recognised, uh, you know, for what we do, the females and that, and and then you know we're on a level playing field with the with the guys. There's no. Um, you know, no, like we compete against each other and whatnot. But uh, it is, yeah, I, I didn't really expect um, to sort of have, I don't know, this much success, I suppose. But I sort of only just got into it as a bit of a hobby. And then, um, yeah, it kind of just bloomed from there and, and we haven't looked back. Yeah. I mean, the Olympics are on at the moment and, it, and there's a couple of events where males and females compete against each other. And when it happens, it's, you know, the commentary around it is that it's such a novelty and they, yeah, our sport is one that really does cater to, it doesn't matter, you know, male, female, it really is a level playing field and we've got some amazingly successful females in our in our sport who are real leaders. Yeah, definitely. Like um, I, I grew up sort of, you know, watching um, Karen Manning and whatnot and, and I still like if Karen likes one of my tweets on Twitter or something like that, I have a bit of a fangirl moment. But um, yeah, it's it is exciting and it, and it's great that that there are so many recognised Reigns women and whatnot in the industry. Okay, well, with that um, as context and background, you were one of the ambassadors for Team Teal um, last season. How important was that for you to to a be part of it and b um, contribute heavily to the to the the amount of money that was raised across the state for that really, really worthy cause? Uh, I think it's fantastic, this cause. Every time um, it, it rolls around, um, everyone does their best to try and raise as much money as they can. And um, this year, uh, myself and Alana Pitt, especially Alana, she pumped out about 100 cupcakes and whatnot and sold them at the race meetings um, around the Riverina. And I just love it. It's just such a great cause. And you go out there and you just sort of, you always go out there to win, but you go out there with just that little bit more drive to kick a winner home and whatnot to get to raise some money um, yeah. for Team Teal. Yeah. Yeah. So it feels extra special when you when you do manage to land a winner through that through that fundraising window. Definitely. And um, this year, I actually uh, I won a race on a horse that I owned and trained myself, and I think he ended up contributing about a thousand dollars just because of all the because of all the female connections in it. So yeah, that one was pretty special. Yeah, and, and it's a collective effort too. It might, you know, it's not just Ellen Bartley. It's you know, it's it's Kerry Ann Morris. It's uh, Amanda Turnbull. It's it's all these fantastic Reigns women and trainers across the state who are all contributing together. There's a real um, sisterhood solidarity around that campaign, isn't there? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, yeah, I'd definitely say it's a sisterhood um, act. Uh, everyone, yeah, the girls all support each other and and whatnot. And yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, you've had some pretty. You've got some pretty, um, pretty decent horses in your stable at the moment. Uh, you got a favourite amongst them? <laughs> I do. Um, he, he's my little bread and butter horse. Is uh, Tiger Finn. I own him myself, and um, he he's not much good, but he goes out there and tries his guts out every single time he goes around. And I, I joked when we brought the place that he paid off. He pays off the mortgage because he goes out and earns <laughs> a check nearly every time he goes around. But yeah, he's. Not much chop, but I'd love another one like him. Yeah. You've got um, Forever Yin as well, which has been really good for you, hasn't isn't it? He has, and um, he's pretty special, that horse. Um, there's a few little stories behind him, and every time – I don't really get nervous, but every time he goes out on the track, I get quite nervous, and um, I'm hoping one day he can, he can pull through and, and bring home a big race for us because I think he's got the ability and whatnot. He just – we just need a barrier draw to prove that he's as good as 
the rest of them out there. Very close through the the TAB Regional Championships campaign there in the Riverina, um, the Riverina region. Um, that was one you really wanted, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, it, it would have been fantastic to get it. Um, I think we in the final we ran second and third and it was just um, bad luck really at the end of the day for Forever Yin. Like he copped a check down the back straight and, and it lost all his momentum and then he powered home. But it was just, yeah, it was just a bit too late. But um, it, I love that um, Tab Regional race. It's just fantastic and everyone gets a bit of a spring in their step when the heat's in that roll around. So, yeah, we'll just try again next year and see how we go next year. Yeah, it really is, you know, as, as one of our regional trainers, um, really is giving opportunities to regional trainers right across the state, isn't it? That that initiative. It's um, yeah, you know, it's been a really successful su- successful addition to the calendar. Yeah, definitely, and and I think like um, it it gives us a chance to race for that bit of pri- better prize money, and, and you sort of you don't have to worry about someone sneaking up from Victoria or down from Sydney to to um to yeah take it from us. But yeah, I, I really like that, the race concept, and and yeah, it's. I think it's one of the best things that they've ever done, really. You have a pretty good facility there in Wagga now, haven't you? I mean, you've got great race conditions there to, yeah. and, and regular racing on a, on a really good facility. Yeah, definitely. The, um, the whole complex now, it, it's, yeah, it's world class, really. And the stabling area and all that, you kind of can't beat it. And, and that now the track, the track's really good now that they've fixed it up and, and yeah, yeah. Um, Hopefully they just keep racing there once a week and, and yeah, we'll be laughing. Yeah. Um, and, and going forward, Ellen, what, what's on the radar? What's what's one that you, you really got your, got your, uh, your eye on? And, and I know you, you're probably hesitant to say anything because you don't want to jinx it. <laughs> um, I think towards the end of the year, we'll line Forever Yin up again at the Vic Bread um, Championships, you know, it, all going to plan with COVID and whatnot. Um, but, yeah, that's one thing I'm looking forward to is because every time he goes down there for that Big Red series, he just um, jumps out of the ground and goes phenomenal. So hopefully this year he can do the same thing. Mm. Well, what, you, you just mentioned COVID, but what challenges is, is COVID and, you know, in lockdown in certain parts of the state, particularly in the Sydney region, greater Sydney region, what challenges is that, is that cause for, for you and your team? Um, I, I guess it, it kind of um, took out a bit of a... Oh, not so much a market, but we used to get quite a few horses um, from people up in Sydney and Bathurst area to take down to Victoria um, to win their Vic Bread. So it's kind of cut out a bit of a market that way because we're only, you know, sort of two hours from the Victorian border. Um, so we've probably lost a little bit of clients that way, but otherwise it probably hasn't really affected us that much. We've been quite lucky that we've been able to just keep on soldiering on through it all and and I think we only lost two race meetings through the whole lot. So, yeah, we've been quite lucky really. Yeah, the industry as a whole has been very fortunate to be able to, you know, continue and maintain a presence, you know, throughout this, you know, several incarnations of COVID and lockdown in various parts of the state. Um, You know, how do you guys look at it when you see other industries shutting down and, you know, going through hardship and yet we've managed to be able to maintain a presence. Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, credit, give credit where credit's due. Everyone's done such a fantastic job to do the right thing and, and yeah, and uh, yeah, give credit to everyone really that we've all done such a good job to just keep it on, go- keep it going. There's a little bit of a um, profile of you on the the Harvest Racing New South Wales website. I think it's 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 very old. It might not even exist, but you know we we people in house get access to some of this stuff. I think it's from 2015 actually. And you tell, you want to get your trainer's license, you want to get your driver's license, you want to be able to drive in some races. That's six years ago, Ellen. You do you look back and and go, gee, I've actually achieved a fair bit in in six years in this in this sport, and uh, you know I'm really proud of where I've got to. Yeah, definitely. I um. I when I first started driving too, like I, I I just I sort of started driving just to um drive my own horses and whatnot. And my first couple of seasons they were quite big seasons, like for a junior driver in the Riverina and um I just got hooked on it. I don't drive as much now as what I used to. I leave it up to Blake, but um yeah, when you look back and realise that, oh hey, I have actually driven a few winners and trained a few winners, it is yeah, it's pretty exciting. 
what's that feeling? Like you, you said, you don't drive as much anymore, but most drivers I speak to talk about that thrill of landing a winner, being first. Um, is it is it a huge rush for you? It is. Um, it is a huge rush, and and um, it doesn't matter like where the winner, where where you're driving at or whatnot. A, a winner anywhere is, um, you know, it's quite good and. I do love it, and I and I make sure if I do drive a winner, I turn around and um, see where Blake is and give him a cheeky smile to let him know that I come out on top that time. But yeah, uh, it is great. Yeah, and to be able to obviously deliver on that for for an owner as well must be pretty cool. It is, and um, I'm really lucky. Uh, all the owners we've got at the moment are just fantastic um, people, and they're all so supportive and whatnot. And and yeah, I love. It's good getting a winner, but it's better getting a winner for, for fantastic people. Yeah. We see you you and your stable primarily at, at Wagga, but you do get around the around the state a fair bit. Got some favorite some favorite tracks that you you get to be uh, get to participate on? Um probably I actually really love the Leeton track. Um we're lucky it's only half an hour away. But the the committee at Leeton um, are fantastic and they, they always do their best, you know, to get the track up to scratch and whatnot and um yeah i just i really like the leeton track um i i did love the old wagga show grounds i thought it was fantastic but um yeah obviously it's got nothing on the on the new facility but um probably stick local yeah they're my favorites leeton and wagga yeah and what about uh have you picked up any any really really sage advice along the way through your journey to get you to where you are now that, that you always um always kind of harp back for um back to and and, and think that that's helped you in your progression um, along the way? Um, I actually, I have a favourite saying and it actually come from the movie Racing Stripes and it was, um, don't look back, leave it all on the track. So I think that's really important, you know, if things don't go your way on the track or whatnot, you, it, you can't, like, um, dwell on it. You just leave it out there and when you come in and, yeah, try again next time. But, yeah, there's no point. No point dwelling on the past and what ha- what's happened has happened and, and, yeah, just look forward and move on to the next thing. I'm sure, if, uh, sure there's plenty of other people dwelling on it out there for you <laughs> and things don't quite go to plan. Yeah, definitely, definitely, it probably is. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, there's always, they, I just always say there's always next time. So, yeah, there's no, there's no point getting upset about something that you have no control over. So, yeah. Yeah, and the next, you know, you're part of the next generation, but at the same time, you've you know, you've been in and around the industry, um, you know, for a fair while now as well. You know, even at a young age, they're coming through so young now. You know, we saw Chloe Formosa at the age of sixteen get a winner with her first drive last last week there in Newcastle. The next generation's coming through, aren't they? What do you say to those guys and, and, and even the mini trotters who want to come through and and be part of our industry? What do you say to them? Um, we, we, there's a few mini trotters around here actually. And, and, um, I, I always, um, make sure I say hello to the kids and, and find out how they're going and whatnot. But, uh, I think they, they just need to know, like, um, you know, to make good contacts at an early age and, and don't be afraid to put in the hard yards. Um, cause it is a hard, it is a hard game and whatnot. But I think if you have, if you surround yourself by the right people, then you'll go a long way. Well, you never know. You keep an eye on the mini trotters. There's probably a probably a good. Look. You're a trainer. You need to be on the lookout for good drivers. <laughs> yeah, I, I um. There's a few young kids that I that I keep my eye on, and I always say that um, they'll be my next junior drivers and whatnot. So yeah, there's a couple that we'll have to keep our eye on and make sure we can snap them up when they're ready to progress onto the bigger stage. Oh, I bet Blake's looking over his shoulder. <laughs> he's, doing that. Yeah, he's probably a bit worried, a bit worried that he um uh, might lose his prime position on the gig. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, tell me this: you're you're obviously you're Blake's partner. You've you've got a gun, you've got a horse. You want Blake to drive it, but he's got a better offer somewhere else. How does that how does that dynamic play out? <laughs> Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, usually I, um, yeah, I'll drive them if if Blake can't. But most of the time, he he does stick true to ours and and drive ours, which uh, um I think he knows keeps me a bit happier. But yeah, um we haven't really had a situation yet where that's been the case. But time will tell. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, thanks so much for joining us on Pacesetters 
Ellen, it's been really, really great to you know, have a good laugh and, and, and understand a little bit of your journey as well. I think, um, you know, you, you're a real leader in our industry and, um, you know, someone, a real shining light for what for what opportunity and potential looks like. So congratulations on so far. Let's hope there's plenty of good winners coming up, whether you're driving, whether you're training, whether Blake's doing the doing the, the driving, you know, um, some great race opportunities down there. Really appreciate you giving up your time to have a chat to us on Pace Setters. No worries at all. Thanks for having me. And to everyone out there tuning in, thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate your support. This has been a lot of fun to be able to bring you some insight into our drivers and trainers. Heaps more to come. Tune in next week on Pace Setters.